Stan Getz would be calling me. And sure enough, the next day, I'm there practicing with my local group of guys who are playing jazz in the house. And my mom comes in and she's like, Brian, Stan Getz is on the phone. That was the great Brian Bromberg relating the story of how Stan Getz called him during his local band practice. You're going to be hearing much more like that on today's episode, a highlights episode, a best of episode. And we're talking about the jazz greats and the people who worked with them. This was a lot of fun to put together, and I think you're going to enjoy following along with these stories. A quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Upton Bass, Modacity, A440 Violin shop and Colstein music more on them later but let's start off with the complete story from Brian about that moment with Stan Getz so there was a before all the arts con- uh, all the arts funding got cut in schools that was a lovely thing um, there was an organization that would bring in great jazz artists legendary jazz artists to do a week of workshops concerts throughout all of Tucson at many different high schools and colleges and things like that So they brought in Ron Carter, Buster Williams, Dexter Gordon, Rufus Reed, uh, and the great, late, brilliant pianist Bill Evans. And so Bill Evans came in, and Mark Johnson was the bass player. And of course, I went to every event they did, got to hang with them. And Mark and I became friends. And I was 18, and I mean, I could play, but I didn't know I could play play, because I'm in Tucson. I have nothing to, 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 to judge it by. And Mark heard me, and we hung out. And seven months later, Mark calls me up, and he goes, yeah, man, Stan Getz is going to call you. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, Stan asked me, I, we were in Europe, he asked me if I knew any, knew any bass players, so I recommended you to Stan. I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay, I've got this great car I'd like to sell you too, but, you know, I didn't think Stan Getz would be calling me, and sure enough, the next day, I'm there practicing with my local group of guys who are playing jazz in the house, and my mom comes in, and she's like, Brian, Stan Getz is on the phone. And the sax player in the band had to sit down. He almost passed out because, like, Stan gets his calling, and here's the sax player in the band, like, what? <laughs> so I talked to Stan, and sure enough, Mark was like, he was right. Stan called me, and I flew to New York to audition. And somehow I got the gig. It was amazing, and that started everything. Chuck Israels also shared how he got connected with Bill Evans and the Bill Evans trio. It's a story uh, fairly well known, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Scott LaFarge was my friend and I became uh, quickly friendly with him for a really short period of time. Uh, Just before leaving for Europe uh, on a job that Joe Benjamin had sent me on and that was a a Jerome Robbins Ballet USA tour. It was a long tour. Started in July and went through October and went all over Europe. And I had just... uh, gotten to know Scotty. I was there at the Village Vanguard sessions that were recorded on on May 30th and 31st of that year. And that was my ideal job, my ideal musical situation, playing with Bill. Mm -hmm. And I was not going to get that job because this fine musician with a close relationship with Bill was in that spot. Shortly after that, it's a kind of a long, complicated story, but shortly after that, uh, I was in Spoleto in Italy and got a letter from a friend telling me that Scotty had died. And at that point, I thought it was likely that uh, that Bill would call me. Mm-hmm. And in fact, he didn't play until I got back in, in October, and uh, there was a telephone call waiting, and I went to work for Bill. Frank Proto was filled with amazing stories about New York back in the day and all the jazz greats wandering around. And here is a very fun story about Frank, who was studying with Frederick Zimmerman at the time, and a very special other student was in his the lesson, I think, just before him or something like that. Taking in those music and going to Birdland, and then you're studying with Fred Zimmerman at the same time. Was was he into jazz at all? Was he? I you know I just picture him with his glasses on the back of the Boeing book or that kind of thing. Was he into jazz or was he was that world foreign to him? Well, it wasn't foreign to him. He wasn't he wasn't a jazz player in the least, but he tolerated more than tolerated. He he enjoyed and encouraged diversity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a, a buzzword today, but but it's a good word. And he had students 
In fact, you know who came for his lesson just before me every week was uh, Mingus. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, and uh, here's, a, here's a good Mingus story. You know, we'd say hello to each other and, you know, kind of nod, and that was about it. But one day I show up for my lesson, and on the music stand, there's a piece of music that I had never seen before. It was it was a hand-copied manuscript, and, and it said bass solo, and it was in treble clef, and this was extremely unusual. I don't know if I ever saw anything in treble clef at that point of my musical life. So uh, Mr. Z came in, and uh, and I said, what's this? So he says, oh, Charlie wrote himself something uh, that he can't play. And he asked me to come to a recording session to play it, and you know he left it for me to practice. So I said, wow. He says, it, it's actually a very uh, interesting little thing. Would, would you like to come to the session and uh, and hear it? I said, sure. So I went to the recording session, and it turns out to be one of the seminal recordings that uh, you might know. It was a, a series of compositions that was commissioned by Brandeis University for some jazz festival that they were having. Except it wasn't, you know, traditional jazz. It, it was uh, all kinds of different music. And the piece Mingus uh, wrote had this this lovely middle section. It was a French horn solo doubled by the bass. Just one bass, arco bass, and the horn in exactly the same register, not in octaves or anything. So the bass was quite high. You know, the horn players on that date, one was Gunther Schuller. Oh, wow. I don't remember if he played the solo or Jim Buffington was another... But I listened to that, and wow. There are so many things to think about when you're practicing. Where do you even begin? Here is Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelfo on what to prioritize in your practicing. First things first, got to measure time. Time is of the essence. You want to get the highest return on your time investment. And the way to do that is through listening to yourself and self-recording. Almost everybody who reads the blogs, blogs of Rob Knopper, Noah Kagayama, Everybody knows self-recording is absolutely essential. So we put it front and center along with time. Recording yourself, measuring the time you've spent on particular sections, and so many other things are available in Modacity. I love this app so much. You can learn more at modacity.co. And if you visit our website, we've got a special offer for lifetime access to the app. Check it out. You'll love it. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve has been researching top graduation for many years. Here's Steve on the topic. I found some old uh, diagram bass tops in an old violin making book that had violins, violas, cellos, and only four basses from kind of the classic period, the early 1800s. And I took a pattern of uh, kind of a topographical map of thicker in the center under the bridge and then you know, the thinnest is right near the edges, you know, just before it flares out and gets strong again. And I put in some measurements that I thought would work. And we use that as a general pattern for top graduation, and it really works. You would be amazed how well this technique works. I've been impressed time and time again at how immediately a bass speaks after coming from Steve's shop and how resonant and beautiful and open the sound is. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. Gary, Gary Peacock, Peacock has a great, great story, story about, about what it was like working with Miles he, Davis. The thing, I mean, he might play the ballad and start out with uh, uh, hitting one note and it would be the same pitch that he played the night before we played the ballad. But there was a, there, it was always the first and last time. It was so fresh and so new. And I'm thinking, how the hell does he do that? How, how can he play the same thing? And it's always like, oh, wow. How is that possible? Where, you know, whew. so there's a, you know, just drawing upon, you're drawing upon something that you can't conceive that you can't rationalize, you can't put it into words. And in that way, it has something to do with realizing a koan, is that you can't rely on language to resolve the koan. 
or to realize the koan. So it feels to me like melodies are like koans. <laughs> <laughs> melodies are like koans. I like that line. That's pretty great. Uh, next up is Gene Perla and how starting to play with Elvin Jones led him to start publishing. And Gene has an extensive background in the music business world. Uh, so here's Gene on the topic. When Elvin called me to join the band, uh, he said, look, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a record. I didn't even play a gig with him. Although I had played with him a few times, sat in with him. And so he said, if you got any tunes, bring them. Maybe we'll record them. So I brought a couple of tunes and he did record them. And when the session was over, I was quite tight with Chick Corea that was playing a lot with him those days. And I called him, and he was a bit advanced, me uh, penetrating into the scene. And uh, I called him on the phone, and I said, well, I just did these couple tunes with Elvin. And I said, uh, I, well, what is what the business? <laughs> you know, what, do I, what should I come say? He said, well, you got to copyright the tunes. I said, oh, I know about that already. That's cool. He said, well, then you need to get a music publisher. And I said, well, what's that? Right? And I didn't see. So he said, call this guy, Krasilovsky. Bill Krasilovsky was a lawyer in the high power. He retired a few years ago. And he, he, was, he loved to do litigation, this guy. Anyway, he wrote a book that's still published by billboards called This Business of Music. And many people consider that the Bible of the industry. It's really, when you read that thing, it's like almost for like, oh, you want to be a music business lawyer, read this, you know. So anyway, he became my lawyer, and uh, I called him on the phone, and I said, I, you know, Chick Corea said I should call you. And he said, well, what do you want? What do you want? He was always in a hurry. And I said, well, I want to, you know, get find him, do something about publishing. And he said, well, why do you want Why don't you just start your own and keep the whole one dollar? Why do you want to split it 50-50 for, for what you're doing? You just do it yourself. I said, Okay, so that's how I started music publishing. Since that interview, I had the chance to not only sit in on Gene Perla's music business class at the New School in Manhattan, but I also got a chance to see him play live in Oakland, which is very cool. Next up, we have Jeff Denson of the California Jazz Conservatory about working with Lee Konitz and also about lick bass versus risk-taking improv. We have a shared... Um, philosophy on improvisation oh and that comes through in the way we play music and he, Lee Lee heard that in the trio and that what is that that is the 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 desire and the willingness to take extreme risks so there's there's a I mean I, I see there's a couple of different camps of, of improvising in the jazz world there's one which is lick based, mm -hmm. and then there's the other that stands up and may fall on your face, but it also may take you some to some other plane, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. There's there's a very clear advantage or strong point that you could start from if if you're using licks in your language. Yeah. Because here comes this chord progression, I know I can do this and it's gonna sound good. So what that means is you've transcribed this thing or you've worked it out on your own, whatever it is, and you do it like, now Jason's asked me a question about my childhood and I will now say line number 37. <laughs> and like, uh, I grew up in a brick house and, this, and that works well and I have the period, I know it fits there and that that's cool. Well, um, yeah, having the licks in your language means you can walk up and sound strong. Yeah. But I'm not attracted to that. This next clip is back in the day on the podcast. I used to have people submit guest interviews, and I had some real gems. So this is a little bit circuitous, but I will explain. So this is Jim Miller talking about Art Davis working with John Coltrane in an interview with Tim Wolfe Jr. So no Jason on this at all, or Art, um, but you're hearing about Art Davis's experience working with John Coltrane. Yeah, I know that he he had a really close relationship with John Coltrane, right? Yeah. Yep. He um, the two of them practiced together on a regular basis for about a year while Coltrane was writing Giant Steps. Yep. He told me that he met Coltrane um, when he was playing with uh, Max Roach. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Max Roach came into the club one night and saw him play and and asked him if he would like to, uh, you know, to get together and practice. Art said, "Yeah, sure." So he said, okay, meet me at this hotel at 8 o'clock in the morning. So Art goes over. 
they go in the, in the room and they played from like 8 o'clock in the morning until it was time for Coltrane to go to work at night at 9 o'clock or whatever. No break for lunch, you know, just straight through. Just played, played, played. Wow. He told me that John Coltrane was one of the nicest men that he, that he ever met in his whole life. Really? And very intense. Very intense, but very, very nice. Upton Bass is at a fascinating transition from selling accessories online, kind of in the early days, to selling other people's basses, to starting to make their own basses, which they now do and make over 120 a year. Here are Eric and Gary of Upton Bass on that transition. So then we stopped getting containers of instruments, right? Yeah, which was a lot of dough all at once. So it was it was taxing, and the quality was going down, down, down with every shipment, you know. And at that point, we were doing so much ourselves, anyways. Final assembly, varnish, setup. It was kind of a no-brainer to start making them in-house. Whatever your playing needs are, Upton Bass will find you an instrument that works with your budget and that you will love for the long term. They have an amazing, loyal fan base that has bought, several people have bought two, three, even four Upton Basses over the years. They stand behind their products. They're beautiful instruments made in the Northeast in the United States. UptonBass.com and thanks so much for sponsoring the podcast. Cole Holstein Music has been supplying the bass world and the music world in general at this point with great services and products for over 60 years. It was started by Samuel Colstein and has been run by Barry Colstein, who I've had on the podcast, and, and they are just such a great company for anything you need for basses. They've got a great selection of instruments. They've got a great selection of bows, accessories, and just a great bunch of people working behind the scenes. Barry has been a true friend to the bass community for so long, and it's so great to have Colstein supporting the podcast. Learn more about everything that they do at colstein.com. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Apply graphite, like pencil lead, to the bridge and nut, the contact points of the string, to ensure the strings slide smoothly on their way up to tension. This prevents them from getting stuck and unwinding or pulling the bridge so that it leans. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Just a few more clips on working with the jazz greats here. Next up, we have Kenny Davis, who played with the Tonight Show Band and so many other people. Here he's talking mainly about working with Dave Holland and John Clayton, but also just the circuitous path of life that he took and that so many of us take. I started hooking up with Dave Holland which was incredible. Wow. I would go up to his house. Really? And we would play, and he would say, hey, man, check this out. You know, he would get on the piano, and, uh, you know, and incredible, man. Yeah. You know? What a great, what a, what a great musical mind. What huh. a great, yeah. Yes, yes, wow. yes. You know, he, he showed me about how to play open, but make, make it sounds cohesive, which is a whole other way of playing. Yeah. And then you, while you're playing the Tonight Show and you're out in L.A., mm -hmm. you get some time in with John Clayton, too. Oh, Another mm. bass legend and wonderful person oh, and so much to offer. John is the ultimate musician and gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. Wow. So you, so you go out there and you're doing, doing the Tonight Show, but then everything starts to build and right. you're out every weekend yes. and busy schedule. Mm -hmm. And wh what, what was the next step for you? you, you you're, you're back here. Now and a certain, what, now, talk about that. Okay, yeah. now I move back to New York. I move back to New York. And um, naturally, I'm setting things up as I'm going back. Yeah. You, know, you know, I'm still living in L.A. I move back. Within five days, I'm doing. I'm, now I'm, I'm, in, I'm doing tours. You know, I'm back to doing my touring, mm -hmm. and then um, um, uh, record dates again. Yeah. I came in doing another record. Uh, uh, let me see what else. And I knew that it was going to be a little slow for me coming back to New York. So I, that was the perfect opportunity for me to go get my masters. So that's what I did. Okay. I said, okay, it's going to be slow for like another year and change, but so that's what I did. So while well, I was a little slow. I um, got my master's degree. 
And and you did that at Rutgers. At University. Rutgers. Yes. Okay. okay. So now I'm teaching it. So uh, well, what a cool, what a cool, right. you know, to the be the student becoming the teacher at right, the institution. Right. And with all that experience under your belt, what a what a a great decision to to go back and get yes. more training. It, right. it says something about who you are and right, the, yeah, kind yeah. Of the lifelong learning and yes, yes, always yes. trying to get lessons with people and oh, absorb. Yes, and yes, and yes, it yes. must have been really interesting having all that experience under your belt and then going. And and was it? Were you studying classical? Were you studying arranging? Were you no, studying what were you? I was studying arranging, there? and uh, I learned how to write for big band. Uh-huh. I learned how to write for you know uh, strings and. Uh, and you'd been doing some of that with John Clayton back in yes, LA too, yes, right? So, yes. Yeah. So, so 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 some of the stuff that I did. Uh, for my final project, I had already done with John. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. What was John's approach to arranging like? What, were, what was it like working wow. with him on that? So I, I, when I when I start my approach to his approach was, I said, so John, what book should I get? What book? I ain't study out of no book. So he started me on uh, transcribing a horse silver to. First, no, no, get the two horns first. Come on, John, I want to, you know, no. Nah. <laughs> get right. the two horns first, right for the four horns. And that's what, and that's what happened. Then we went with bigger horns. Yeah. yeah. Next, we've got Kurt Morrow, who I talked with about his experiences with Mill Tinton. And I love chatting with people about people that are no longer with us, like Mill Tinton, but experiences and reminiscences like that Art Davis story. So this is Kurt relating the story of Mill Tinton and Christian McBride first meeting. Christian McBride's first CD had just come out. Uh, what is it? Getting to it, I think it's called. Um, and I had listened to it and I had actually tried to play, you know, work out some of it. Um, in the early nineties and I had gone to the, I think I'd gone to the restroom and I had come out and Milton, of course, I, in that environment, I could leave him and everybody be there to take care of him. So he didn't need me there for that, but I'd come out and, and, uh, Milton was standing next to Christian and he was talking to Christian. And you see, I had just, it's a little embarrassing to say this, but I have to be accountable and call a spade a spade. I just didn't really know what he looked like. I knew what he looked like from his CD cover, but I mean, I hadn't been living with it and I hadn't been. And so, and plus I'm just a polite guy, especially in those situations and certainly back then. And so I walked up and now I've got, I'm kind of like almost in between the two, but I'm just standing next to Milt and Milt talking to Christian McBride. And, uh, uh, in a moment, I just said, hi, my name's Kurt. What's your name? And Milton like smacked me in the arm. He goes, man, that's Christian McBride. What do you mean? What's my name? What's your name? That's Christian McBride. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. You know, I didn't know what to say. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I have your disc. You know, I just, but, but when you have that many of that level of player walking around you all the time, you know, you just got to keep your eyes on, oh, there's that person. Here's Larry Grenadier on the experience of working in the Brad Meldo trio. Well, you know, uh, I got to say the, the most important thing for me is the, the musical personalities of the people I play with. Yeah. It's, I mean, because sometimes, you know, people ask the question, like, how do you play differently in a piano trio as opposed to a saxophone trio without mm-hmm. a piano or without a chordal instrument, maybe? And, you know, I think there are some there are some difference, but the biggest similarity is that I'm, it's always who I'm playing with that that makes what I play uh, mm-hmm. makes me change the way I play or whatever. You know, it, how I react to the musical personalities of the people. Um, so with Brad, uh, when we first started playing, it was, first of all, it was, it was super obvious that he had incredible ears, that everything I played was taken in on some level and, uh, you know, not necessarily react, not, he wouldn't react to it, but he, I could tell that he heard it. Yeah. So that's like the most beautiful thing that you want to find in a bandmate, right? Somebody who's listening to what you're playing, uh, who's, who's interested in what you're playing. And then we just had a similar idea of what type of music we wanted to make. It was a combination of all the historical music that we loved growing up and uh, 
but then we're trying to take it to a ne- another step with it and try to make it contemporary. And um, we just found a kind of a, a bond in how we thought about making music together. And uh, and that it's true. I mean, every time we play, you know, whatever it's been, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, it's it always like the kind of like the first time. It's like we're exploring and we're listening and we're, it's never gets anywhere close to being routine or uh, like a job or mechanical, you know, it's, we're just kind of always finding the music in the moment and reacting to each other. And it's just a, a great scenario to, to exist in. Here's Marco Panacea on the experience of working with Joe Lovano. He just basically, uh, he, he really let us do our thing. I mean, it, it was really about, I think there are two kinds of teachers, you know, in the world, there are teachers that really, you know, dictate every single aspect of, of what you do. I mean, like, you know, they really, like, want you to sound like themselves or, like, do specific things. But with him, it was really all about um, helping us find our own voice, you know. So he would really, like, encourage us to kind of just do our thing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and redevelop that. Uh, so there was, like, the, a really important uh, message for me, you know. Yeah. That's something that I that I try to do with, with my own students as well. I mean, I don't like to dictate too much, you know, like, you know, this is how you should do it. This is wrong. This is right. You know, like I really try to assess, you know, where they are at that particular stage in their lives and try to give them advice so that their own musical selves, you know, can shine even more. We'll wrap up today with this story of Pete Coco's talking about getting the chance to work with Ron Carter, study with Ron Carter. Well, you do the, the first thing you need to know <laughs> is that we call him Mr. Carter. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. My bad. <laughs> so it, in lessons, it's uh the first. Well, you go to his apartment uh, in the city, and right away he's just he's just very welcoming. He's a very warm individual. Um, he's got r- really just a wonderful spirit. Uh, like you know, like a mentor should. Um, but the first lesson with him, obviously, I was I was scared, you know. Right. And uh, so um, he agreed to give me a lesson. I, I met him as a partner. I brought my bass with me, and he basically made me play an F major scale in half position, and then critiqued it. But the the thing that's that's so wonderful about what what he does is he really gets down to the nitty gritty of your playing. And he, he really challenges you to think about everything you're doing, like every note you're playing, where you, your left hand is positioned, how your fingers are over the board, where your right hand is positioned. So a lot of things that after playing for 20 years, you know, you take for granted, where you just think, oh, yeah, I just do this this way because I've been playing a long time. He really brings you back to the beginning and um, and kind of, you know, boils it down to, to, to rebuilding your technique and refining all of it. So that was kind of the beginning of the lesson. So right away from the first 10 minutes of the lesson, I had 10 things that I had never even thought about, you know, that I said to myself, wow, this is amazing. And, uh, and then as the lessons progresses, you know, a lot of it is about, uh, walking. I mean, um, you know, sound, your tone, consistency, all the things that Ron is, uh, that make him him, you know, that make the reason why he's on 2,500 records. So it's really, this, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, and outside of that, man, he's, he's just, he's such a kind hearted man and, and he's very giving of his time and his energy. And he, you know, he's just, he's just got such a wonderful way about him. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I feel like we've really become, you know, kind of, close friends and and you can tell he really cares about his students he cares about the music and he's another guy man he's just he just works he works so hard he's such a dedicated player and and person and you know, he's he's just a great role model he's another one of those guys where it's like man when i grow up i want to be ron carter you know <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed following along with all these past guests talking about working with the jazz greats. And we have many more stories we could share on this topic in the archives and many more that we will share in the future. And obviously, we're going to be continuing to talk about this. So check out any of the episodes in their complete 
completeness, completion, whatever the word is, as I'm fading, I'm recording all of these best ofs in one giant day. So I'm starting to get a little loopy, but check them out. Controversyconversations.com slash highlights. Thank you to Krista Copper for putting these all in catalog, archived, uh, timestamp form. It makes it so easy to go through and find these topics. And Krista also synthesizes these different topics. So I'm able to just go in and look and say, oh, let's explore this, let's explore this. And it's just such a pleasure to do this. I really hope you enjoyed it. Reach out to me, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. And thank you to the rest of the team on the podcast. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Check out Mitch's award-winning bases at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Bye.